My name is Professor Stephen Kiamagitahi. I'm the Vice Chancellor at the University of Nairobi. Before I became the Vice Chancellor, I served as the Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Human Resources and Administration in this university. And I also served as the principal of the College of Agriculture and Veterinary Sciences. And before then, I was a founder director of Wangari Mother Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, an institute which was an initiative of Professor Wangari Madai, where we worked together to ensure that this institute is established. And the institute is aimed at providing an opportunity for bridging the no-do gap. Please tell me why the institute was set up. What was its purpose? Um, you know, Wangari, Professor Wangari Madai, was uh, an anatomist, but coming from a background of uh, biology. She had done um, her masters in the US, uh, working with, uh, with the pineal body of the Japanese quail. Uh, that is an organ you find in the brain, and it is involved in uh, trying to control the body in day at the night. It tells you it's day, it's night. You know, if you stay along without sleeping, your body becomes a bit restless and it gets fatigued. This is a, is a body clock. So she was doing some work of morphology on this organ. It's called the pineal body on the Japanese quail. After she finished that work uh, from the biology perspective, she came back to the department of uh, uh, fat anatomy and physiology. Initially in zoology, to try to look for work. She did not get in zoology, but in fat anatomy, she found there Professor Hoffman, uh, who was able to take her up there. And when she came uh, in this uh, department, she started initially to say she want to work with the uh, still the same organ. But later she changed and decided and worked on the testes of the bull. Uh, the early development of the testes of the of the of, of the cow, you know, the bull calf. And she did a very good work of electron microscopy um, of, this, uh, of the testes. And then after that, she grew in the department. But later, in about 77, she started giving a movement and left. Uh, later on, I was myself connected with Wangari. I was following what she's doing. I was very interested with her work. And we reconnected in 2003 when I got funding to establish an electron microscopy lab in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. So I called her, and she came uh, as a guest during this time. It's because I knew she was doing electron microscopy work. But we continued with the relationship talking to each other. And at one time then she said, in 2008, she said, um, she has been thinking of how to come back to the university. In fact, put it another way, I asked her, what is it we can do together to ensure that you continue to offer leadership and mentorship to the students in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, where I was then serving as, as Associate Dean. And she said, actually, I have been also been thinking about this. We were then just having a cup of coffee with her, our common friend, Professor Peter Gear and the Professor uh, Fatistin Bayer. And she said, yes, I've been thinking of how to come back. And let us have a formal meeting where we can discuss this matter. And in about a week, we held another meeting now, a formal meeting at Jakarada Hotel, over see a cup of coffee. And we said, she's, I, I asked her, what is it? I've been thinking about, I have been employing people from universities who have done environment, environmental science, they have done forestry, they have done this and the other. But when they come, when it comes to doing the work, mm. they don't know what, where to begin. They have a lot of knowledge in the head, nothing but, practical. but the practical, nothing to do and the experience. Mm. Look like they have not touched the soil, they have not planted the tree, they have not nurtured it, they have not uh, seen that the environment is not something you can see like in a, in a in a petri dish, it is a very complex thing. It is an interaction of so many other things, the people, the environment, the air, the what. 
So she said, now, how can we put up an institute that can bridge this no-do gap? How can we get that? That by the time somebody leaves the university, he, he has the knowledge and he can also do those things they have. That was the beginning of the discussion of the institute. That was 2008. Mm -hmm. How did you then proceed to raise the funding that you needed for the institute? Because I read that you raised about one point something billion, 1.4 billion. Yeah. Then uh, we began the discussion with her. The work conceptualizing the institute. I had many meetings with her uh, to get the, the true vision of what exactly she needs about the, the institute. I'd held retreats, called other people. Sometimes we would hold a meeting for a whole day with her, just sharing what is it she would think that this institute would be. Now, after the conceptualization, we did a design competition for people now to design the institute reflecting that thinking. And this was uh, something, a process we finished in about uh, 2010. And you are aware, in 2011, she passed on. Yeah. She was, at that time, uh, doing quite a bit of networks. We had to go to meetings to begin the initiative of how to begin to, to fundraise. But given the amount of money that was needed, we said we needed to establish a vehicle of doing this fundraising. So we were beginning that kind of discussion with her. Then she dies. When she died, we, I, I had now to go back to the drawing board. I remember then even the media asking me, now that she has gone, Will this dream now come true, or this has come to an end? And the other people just thought that this one now is the end of the story. But I said, for her, I will put all my energy into this thing, and as it is realized based on what she expressed to me. And I kept on contacting different people. Uh, fortunately, at that time, we had... Um, she had made some contacts, sometimes in African Development Bank, and we had started some discussions, which at that time had not matured. We had some discussion with, the, with, the, with some professors in Copenhagen yeah? uh, on some research we wanted to do on Mau Forest, and the grant was also uh, in the process, so the grant was also awarded actually in 2012. Then, after that, I actually went to the partially to the, to the ministry. And I told, asked the ministry, could they consider supporting me to get funds for the, for the design work of the institute? And uh, initially, I asked them, could you take over the consultants that we were already engaged with? But they said now that process of procurement is different. The ministry has, is guided by certain public procurement that has a disposal act. It has to start, if we support you, we must start procuring from scratch. The Ministry of Education then. At that time, the PS there was Professor Kiaba. And they said, yes. Uh, I said, yes, I have no issue. You can begin the process as long as you support me. So they started. And then I had also interaction with the African Development Bank. Uh, they said, oh, we, they, we have little money. Initially, when she came to us, she was talking about this amount of money. I said, no, let's have whatever we have so that we get this work started. So they also uh, came on board within a context, uh, uh, the context of a project which was uh, called Relevance to Higher Education. It was a project which was targeting to bring, to train more engineers for the country that we will now uh, continue to support the infrastructure work. And they said, okay, this issue of environment also is also important in the context of relevant, relevance. So we also support you. So they also incorporated this and they went through various stakeholder meetings and they all agreed that this is a good thing. So that uh, also came in. So the, as a result now, we were able now to put together the funding to pay the contractor and the funding to do the design work. 
from different sources. Mm -hmm. And I guided that process now and with the several meetings because of the discussions I had with her, it was possible now to share very closely with the consultants and with the contractors that they designed the institute based on what she wanted to, to see. She wanted to see an institute that uh, offers an opportunity for experiential learning for graduate students, undergraduate students, even student, uh, uh, students from uh, uh, basic education that they can come there and just walk around and learn and interact with the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so then also the issue of uh, how you, you manage water, runway, how do you manage it? Do you learn it into culverts and out of the institute? Or do you allow it to be absorbed and percolate the ground? What is it you need to do? So a lot of those things are the use of sunlight. Mm. I would imagine that the yes. institute has been built according to Ankari Malai's environmental standards. Yes, yes. All right. So it's, 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 it's the building, it's the buildings are carbon neutral and all that? Yes, 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 yes. All right. Then the lighting thing? when you go there, yeah. big windows, nini. during the day you don't need to put any light. Okay. Yeah. All right. I must, I must pay a visit. Please do. Very well. Um, so how long has the institute been um, operational? You know, the, the, the institute has been operational for quite a while because the minute we, when I had a discussion, this discussion with her, and later on we brought this discussion to the Vice Chancellor, University of Nairobi. At that time, the Vice Chancellor was Professor George Magoha. She, and now he is a, the, the CS Education. He bought into the idea immediately. He, he saw it. Yeah. We came with Wangari, we briefed him one morning, and he said, this is a good idea. And the university, under my leadership, is going to support this one. So, as I following this, it was taken to the University Executive Board, it was taken to Senate, it was taken to Council, and all the organs of the university supported it and had it established in, in the, at the end of 2009, when she was still with us. So even as we were doing conceptualization and all this thing, the institute was already in place. But in 2012, is when now I, I had a, the first program approved by Senate to begin teaching postgraduate students at the institute. And we have had the first cohort of four students. That is the, a program on, on a, a PhD on environmental governance and management. So, and that, now since then, we, we have been taking students every year since 2012. Yeah. Okay. So it has been in operation. So even by the time now we are putting the, 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 the stone and mortar, by the time we are putting down the concrete part there of the institute, it was, the student, we just moved them there, mm -hmm. which was uh, in about 2018. 2018 is when now this, they were moved in there to start occupying the institute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very well. So mm -hmm. that is the background of the institute. Is there mm -hmm. any other than the... Um, the, the first cohort of students. Mm. Is there anything that we can look forward to or that maybe you can highlight that this institute has perhaps innovated or, or some, some, some new program that the institute is working on, something that is directly related to the national environment? You know, we have, uh, we also later developed a program of masters uh, on environmental governance. And again, we have been taking cohort of students who have gone out there to be employed. Now, the other thing we did was to establish a collaboration with the University of Copenhagen. And we said we needed to have students who think of environmental issues from their complex perspective as messy problem. What, how do we do it? We get students from all disciplines, from anthropology, from economics, from biology, from geography, from agriculture, from faith from architecture, from all those, we put them together. We, we create groups of them across this plane, and then we take all these students to the field. They stay for two, three weeks with the communities, and they live in the houses of, 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 of the community members. 
eat with them, uh, sleep there the time they sleep, wake up the time they sleep, go for breakfast, go to the chapel with them, and now start to see what problems confront the society. After uh, a week, they do a proposal on what they need to do and begin to collect data. And then after that, they present the same. By the time they are exiting the third week, they present some of their findings and some of their recommendations to the community before they exit. And this we have done every year since that time. Even this time we did it, it the institute did it just before the COVID hit because we do it at the end of February and the beginning of March. Okay. Yeah. So, because we, we expect that those students now, when they look at people as members of a community, they can relate with them. Yeah. Because we don't want people who are just here in, in a lobby, just seeing PowerPoint notes and all this kind of thing. You take them to the people and they don't know where to begin. No, they can relate. They sleep there and they wake up there. Yeah. If those people don't have a shower, they know how to, 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 to shower. What the struggle they're having to grow something in their soil? Why is something not growing? Not theory. Yes. Then they say, they tell the people, this is how you need to do things better. Yes. And we have taken them in different sites, and we believe that that has impacted on those communities. In fact, when we come to the day of feedback to the community, we, they would hire a social hall. And it would always be full. In fact, you need to select those who come. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have seen those students walking around with them. I see. Yeah, I remember yeah, Wangari, yeah. Uh, mm. Professor Wangari used to mm. say mm. Um, one time mm. she uh, went to the village and tried to get the ladies, the women, to plant trees. And uh, the, some government officials turned up and they said, uh, you know, you need a PhD before you can plant a tree. Mm. And the professor was shocked. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, what, 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 since you, you knew the professor quite well, yes. um, what did she teach you? She taught me a lot of critical thinking and the patience and the listening skills. Uh, that don't take everything you hear, you read at face value. In fact, that initially it was a little uh, problem for me because we would go somewhere. We have, uh, she said, I need you to come for some meeting. We discuss some issue. We go and discuss and discuss, and then agree. Agree on how we are going to do it, and when. Then we just part ways. Then let alone uh, tomorrow, or the day after she calls me, uh, Professor, that's how she used to call me. Now, you know that thing we discussed? I was thinking about it. We need to have another meeting with you. Now I say, what about, and we had agreed we are starting, then, we, then I go, I see her. I say, no, when I thought that thing, I don't think that is the correct way to do it. I say, but now how do we go back to the same people and tell them that we have changed? No, 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 let's call them. So I, I would, uh, initially I was a little tense, you get that kind of, because that's not the thing, uh, the way I'm used to. I would say there are minutes, minutes number this, already approved this, you know. Yes, but uh, <laughs> she, she didn't have a problem starting all again. She didn't have a problem starting all over again. Yes. So I had to learn that patience that you can start all over again and you can offer yourself to even have a better opportunity mm. Yeah, mm. than if you followed it the way it was before. You get it? Yes. So, yes. so she, she would just come, no, 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 let's, let's, let's think about it. Then you think, then you, think, then you say, okay, okay, okay. And then you think you have solved it. Then she goes, her head is still moving, is still moving. And then she goes again. So I learned now not to hold things so tightly like this. You get it? Because otherwise we will not work together. Because I think me, I'm a little. But I learned. That's how she had reached where she had reached. Wangari Madai became a leader. Even without, for a long time, without a position. She was a leader, a recognized leader in the, in the country. And she would meet presidents. Isn't it? She yes. meet she meet very senior uh, as and recognize her voice, recognize her leader, not based on a position. Aha, as a person, because of the issues she would bring yes. on the table. So I learned that, and also that issue of listening. Now you see, now obviously she had to work with. She was a professor in anatomy. Yes. This is also my background. 
and uh, we are taught about the issue of a lot of details. The blood vessel passes through here, the nerve passes through here, etc., etc., why the body works the way it works. So you, you have, the mind has a lot of complex information. But you are just going to talk to these women. They don't have all this information, but you have to be patient with them. The, the approach doesn't look like it is orderly at all. You get it? Yes. yes. You would prefer that uh, they allow you to talk and tell them. You get it? Yes. But you listen. You, so you just sit down with them. They talk, uh -huh, and the other one talks, 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 and she contributes. And because she had learned that, that uh, thing that she can also change what she has said, you get it. Mm. Then there is really no problem. Even them, they accept that she can say, they can also say, they say. And finally, the truth is found. And she was able to mobilize a lot of groups through a very well-organized structure in the country and out of this country through that method of interacting and people feeling accommodated mm. by her. I yeah, have been yeah. told by somebody else that mm. indeed that that is somebody else has said the same thing. Yeah. Mm. She had a, a, a bottom-up approach. Yes, yeah. Uh, to issues, she would start from the grassroots and end up uh, with the president. Yes, but she would start at the grassroots. Yes, yeah. What were the thing? What what was, in your view, mm. what was her greatest? What were her frustrations? What were her challenges? What what used to mm. make her feel like? Is it worth it? Did you ever encounter her, or was she always uh, uh, Rohoju, as we say? <laughs> <laughs> did she have those moments of, I feel like giving up? Yeah. Uh, did, she, did you ever encounter that in her, or was she always, yeah. you know, uh, a determined lady? The ones no, no, no. But you know, at the, before, in the last days now, because yeah. I interacted with her more and more. Uh, even be, before she passed on. She had some various uh, concerns, and she thought that there are certain things maybe she may not have done correctly. Uh, she thought that she would have started working with the university, Masharia. But you see, she did not have that access because of the way the regime was. You were, you were fighting the government. The university is seen as a government body. Yeah? In fact, the first time she said she was very happy. Since 1980, uh, when she left, when she came back now in 2003, she told me it's the first time she has been able to come back to the university formally, invited by a, 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 a person, because that time I was associated dean and the acting dean. Yeah. Because she just left, and uh, you remember she, was, uh, she wanted to contest for Teto. And then she was told you must resign first before you present your papers. She resigned. By the time she went to present her papers, she was told that she was not a registered member of parliament and uh, mem in Teto. And as a result, she cannot be cleared. You know those days. You know now you can register anywhere yeah. and contest anywhere. Those days you register where you will contest. So she was registered in Nairobi. You know. So she came back. And now she had no job in the university, and she had no job. She had no opportunity to go as member of parliament. She has explained the struggles she went through in, in her book. But now, the, the, the issue is that now she has tried to create this uh, big structure in the Greenberg movement. How does she make, how has she have made those initiatives sustainable? She felt they needed to be anchored in an institution like this one, which can continue to infuse into this institution a lot of new knowledge. And the, she continued, she was expressing it to me. She said, she sees the institute, which is anchored in the University of Nairobi and the Greenman movement. She will see it as a comet. She will see the, the, the university and the institute offering, like, offering the head yeah. to continue this movement and the Grima movement, which is anchored in the community as a tail. So she felt like she, she, she needed adequate time to do this. And you could tell, like, says, at that time when she started, she wasn't feeling, she wasn't that well, because you know, it was yeah. the cancer. Mm. But I could tell from her that she felt she wanted to rescue this Grima movement. And the only way, if she had started earlier, to ensure it is fully embedded 
within the university so that those community problems that are identified through the community networks she has for Greenway Movement are interfaced with the knowledge in the university and the, 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 the research in the university is informed by those problems and then the university people go to the community to solve those problems. So that leakage is not that she had missed that one and uh, it was important that she does it. So that, that is the reason really why she, she spent all the time to ensure that this is done. Okay, yeah. um, mm. the, the professor used mm. to say, mm. and I just want to get your perspective on this, that the next major world war mm. will be fought because of the environment and specifically over water. What do you think? You know, first of all, she, when, even when she was starting the Green War Movement, you know, it was, she brought the women together because she's, she said we need to, they need to protect the soil and also to provide the firewood and all this kind of thing. And later she brought in even the army. And when she was uh, talking about the army need to be there, she said, when we lose soil, through uh, this soil erosion, it's like losing a territory and you have big barracks with the military people. They are just there and the territory is going. So can the military go out and protect the territory by planting the trees so that the soil does not go because you know it takes years and years to create soil. When you see it going down the river, going down and into the Indian Ocean to get that soil is very difficult. Those who have prob prob probably traveled in Israel know what it is not to have soil. Yeah? Mm. That you have material there which you cannot grow anything. Yeah? So, now, the issue of water. The minute you clear the forest upstream, and therefore uh, uh, those streams do not continue to generate water and flow to feed the community downstream, then you get people coming and bringing animals to graze and even coming to graze on, a, on a agricultural land and therefore brings, bringing conflict. So you say, let us protect our forests, which is the source of our water, and protect our rivers. And if we, because if we don't do this, there is a, a big potential for conflicts. And you have seen the conflicts in the mouth. Yeah. Actually, I was going yeah. to ask you yeah. the next yeah. question. Yeah about um, 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 the Mao, mm. but um, she was, um, at, uh, she became very unpopular at some point, yeah. even with the ordinary Mwananchi, mm. because of her opposition to the Shamba mm. system. Yes, yeah. And um, she remained adamant that the Shamba system mm. is destructive to our forest. Was she, mm. she was vindicated, you think? Yes, she, she was very dedicated. You know, uh, because I, I discussed with her on those things. Because, you know, the thing is that the, the chamber system, initially I think she, she didn't think it can be a big issue. Yeah? But it came out that it was not a sustainable way of regenerating our forests. Because what communities would do is that uh, they would plant those trees, start planting beans and maize. And when those trees start growing and start providing shade to the beans and to the maize, they now begin to cut them. But even worse, you are given this size, but you begin opening more. Mm. You get it? Mm. So that, that was the, the main conflict. So she started her own process now of reclaiming forests, not that one, yeah. where you get, she hires uh, some guards, the trees are planted, you follow that tree, and you are paid some little money when it reaches a certain age, when it will not now be shocked by the weed growing around it. You get it, because if you plant trees in the forest, after some time, they are overwhelmed by other 
other growths. Mm. So they assumed someone who need to nurture it up to a certain level. So now she would pay them up to a certain level. If it reaches a certain age where it can now survive on its own, you are paid. She found that a better method. Mm. Yeah. She, did, she would pay, yeah. the, I think she used yeah. to pay the women um, yeah. four shillings per tree. Yes. But the thing is, where did she get the money to do that? Oh, she was fundraising. You know, initially when she started the, the, the fundraising, I mentioned someone called Professor Peter Gear, uh, who we met in that 2008 over coffee and began the discussion of the institute. I went to do my PhD in Bern, uh, in Switzerland, and that's where I got to interact with Professor Peter Gear because he was my mentor. And he was following about Wangari every day. So I asked him, what is it about Wangari? He said, you know, we used to raise money for Wangari. We would keep a tin in the coffee room. Because of the, what, those things she was doing, we supported them. Everybody would just come and drop something, drop something, drop something, to go and support those women. Because through paying them from planting trees, she was also empowering the women. Women did not have access to money. You know the money in the countryside, if you have to have money, is if you sell your sugar cane those days, yeah? mm -hmm. or you sell a cow, yeah? or a goat, but the sugar cane, the cow, the goat, or even if it's tobacco, is owned by the men, yes. or the coffee. Yes. How else can the women access money? Yes. So now she gave them this entry that they can also have their own money. That, that means empowering them. Yes. yes. She gave them an, um, yes. an entry point into the cash economy. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, mm -hmm. Because I know time, and then mm -hmm. I know John is uh, looking at his watch. Yes. Um, what would one, the professor say about uh, coronavirus today? What, if she was here, what would she say? Is there any link, do you think, between our activities as human beings, the way we uh, interact with our environment? And uh, these pandemics, Do you, I don't want to, 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 to make any connections that don't exist. I'm just mm. asking you for your opinion. Mm. Do you think uh, if she was here, she would make a link? Or do you think there's any link? Definitely she will. You remember she was a big protector of open spaces. She protected the whole park, she protected Karura, and the, all those areas. We have some, I, some little ideas now that it's likely that this transmission of this uh, corona is taking place even more uh, indoors than outdoors. Right, right. So provision of those kind of spaces where people can go and relax and interact and get mm. space where you stay there, another person stays there, especially in a city like this, is a good opportunity. Because when you don't have this space, if you need to have any meeting, any discussion, you can only meet in your sitting room, which are small. So, but these open spaces gives that opportunity. I definitely should say yes. I have walked. I do a walk every, every Sunday or Saturday morning. And you go through uh, Aboretum. You go through whole park. And you see people seated, one person there, one person there. They don't even, they are not even wearing masks. You get it? Yes, yes. But you can imagine if they were indoors. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so these open spaces provide uh, an opportunity for a good environment. But then, obviously, the way we dealt at the beginning, beating up people mm. and all those kind of things, probably she would have commented on it because that was a bit of a human right infringement. And she get. was a human rights proponent. Yes, 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 yes. So, as we wind up, uh, just a, again, I don't expect you to have a definitive answer, but mm. where do you think her inspiration came from, her courage to do the things that she did? Uh, no, what, the, what was it that, um, uh, was it her children, was it, mm. why did she care about the environment so much? Was it just her nature? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. I think she, she rode uh, with her, her own nature, her own personality. Yes. She was a person of conviction. After she has taken time, like I said, she takes time on an issue, after she has made up her mind now, she was ready to go and the sacrifice whatever she has, material she has, whatever comfort she has, to ensure yeah. that is achieved. Because yeah. she, 
you can, uh, some of this is not even registered in her book. When she went to do her PhD in Germany, and she was working with uh, uh, some professor there, she had some issues, and then I think there was a, an, an issue she did not like in that relationship. She just packed and came back to Kenya. Really? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 she just came and they said, no, she's not going to continue with it. And she came to Kenya and they work, uh, found now Professor Hoffman who has said she had to change the project and, and they begin now working on the, you know, initially she had, she had gone there to continue working on the pineal body. And she worked on it a little and the professor was telling you, you need to widen it like this and then she didn't like, she packed, she came. And then she was uh, advised by the mentor what to do. And she did it here. Yeah. That's how she ended up now she getting her PhD, PhD here. Yes, in yes. Nairobi. Yes, yeah. and she left that German thing. So, yes. so that is, and you can trace her. Yes. You see also now, again, when she was refused, this um, uh, going to contest as a member of parliament. Mm. She just again moved. Uh, to this world of uh, consultancy and the other to try to support her family, etc. Yeah. So she, she, when she sat down and was convinced of something, she just went. She went for it. She went for it. Yeah. Finally, yeah. how will you all, how will you remember? What is your favorite memory of the professor? Of her? Yes. What is your favorite memory? Whether it is the coffee that you had, whether yes. it was a conversation that yes. you had. What, yeah. what is? What do you remember about her that uh, makes you smile? Yeah, the, the simplicity. Yes that she carried along with her, that humility. Just, just, just being free with whichever company, whatever people you are, you're feeling relaxed and comfortable, not feeling threatened, feeling confident, you know? Mm. Yeah. Even the Nobel yeah. Prize didn't change her. They, they did not change her. Yeah. When she got her Nobel Prize, 2004, I remember I had it uh, through the lady very quickly. I was very happy. I called her. We drew her mobile number, and she picked. You get because she had my number. Because I say congratulations, yeah. And she picked th that kind of thing. You know, some people now, when they reach a certain status, now they refuse to take your call. You get it? Mm. No, it didn't change her. Any time I would call her, I would reach her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, Professor, yeah. um, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, that was a wonderful conversation. Yes. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah. And I hope you'll give me another opportunity to come and talk to you about other matters. Yes. Today it was Professor Angari Madai. We'll do another that. day, yes. something else. Yes.